Hey, and welcome to this week's episode of The Roundtable. My name is Hunter Lee, and I'm joined here in San Francisco by Spelzy. Hi. And still in Seoul, Korea for one more weekend, Travis. Hello. Hello. So we just finished up semifinals weekend. Uh, we saw Samsung White dominate Samsung Blue, a 3-0 series, and then uh, Royal Club go to five games against, uh, against OMG and pull out a victory in the end. Travis, big takeaways from the weekend. What, what was semifinals like? Uh, semifinals were really, really exciting. Uh, the venue here was fantastic. Um, the Korean games were interesting for sure. Um, or sorry, the Samsung games were interesting for sure. Uh, in the sense that, like, I, I don't know. I don't think anybody expected it to be a stomp. Uh, actually, when I interviewed Spirit, he did point out that, like, if we lose to White, uh, it'll be like a 3-0 situation. So I guess he did. But it wasn't. it wasn't really what... I think people expected, uh, and then uh, Royal Royal was just I don't know those that match up was really really cool. Uh, Royal, I don't know, like those guys are incredible. It's hilarious to me that they made it to the finals. Uh, I interviewed Insect whenever I was in Taiwan. I think it was maybe one of the first interviews I did, and I asked him, "Hey, you know, like uh, your team, which well obviously wasn't on it at the time, but they made it to finals uh, last year. Is there a chance they could do it?" He said, "We need a miracle." And it uh, looks like they got their miracles. So, I don't know. I thought this weekend was really hype. Spilzy. Yeah, I think it was really interesting, like you said, for two different reasons. Like, the first series was interesting because nobody really expected the 3-0 stomp by White. Like, I, I think I said on last week's show that Blue could probably win. And that, like, they were looking extremely dominant. They just crushed them. It was, like, really kind of crazy in the, like, kind of predictions aspect. But then the second series was just really entertaining to watch and really interesting to watch from a, like, they're dueling it out all the time. It was really crazy and interesting picks, and the Pantheon Game 5 was really fun. I was shocked by White's dominance. I mean, I, you know, you expected them to play well, play well early, and Blue is more of a late-game team, so maybe that's, that's how you saw it going. But their ability to get a lead and then hold on to it and just dominate mid-game, yeah. you know, from, like, eight, nine minutes just straight on from there and just punish Blue repeatedly... It was it was a dominant performance. It wouldn't give yeah. me a lot of hope if I'm Royal Club. I mean, that was yeah. crazy, crazy, crazy dominant. I really, really liked the team comps that uh, White pulled in game one and two. I think this is something that we would never be able to see in the NA scene because I don't think they have enough coordination. They like p picked like all skirmish team comps and they would just like split the team fight up in like a way that we never see in NA. In NA, like everybody just charges one guy and they all focus and that's like a big thing. Like you call a target and you hit, hit that target. In this, like they would like have two people hit this target and three people hit this target. I don't know how they like called that. Like it's really interesting. Like they'll be like, okay, I know you can 1v1 that guy. Everybody else zone these other four people off. And it was like really interesting, I thought. Like something that we could only see at Worlds. I uh, I was hanging out with some of the analysts today, and one of the things they were talking about is that it's just kind of crazy because there are these moments when you're watching these Koreans play, and it feels as though, you know, like everyone's just, it's everything's so coordinated, but there's no time to even, like, analyze the situation, so everyone just operates on, like, almost like an instinctual level, and they pull off these, like, crazy feats, you know, that you would never really be able to see um, out of Western teams. And so, yeah, like, I agree. Like, it's, it's just crazy to watch these guys all go in and everything just go, like, so they just ride the wave. And it's very funny. I mean, I know we'll get to this in a second. It's almost kind of funny to see a very similar but at the same time very different thing from Royal when you just see them all charge in and, like, all right, go. We'll deal with it as, we, as it comes to us. You know, it's, it's kind of a funny situation. Yeah, well, I think that's, that's the, the beauty, I guess, of practicing. And if the, maybe, you know, if all the talk about the Korean ecosystem and other things is better, you're better practiced. You practice to take the thinking out of play so that you're just operating on instinct and you can go lightning fast with whatever's going on. Maybe that's a reflection of a higher level of coordination coming out of a, a more efficient practice system. And NA teams aren't really there yet because the, the scrims are less efficient, something like that. I do think it was nice to see the return of the mid-game as a dominant strategy. I mean, that's been a theme all throughout Worlds, and it was mm -hmm. sort of perfected in those comps, this kind of double AD poke comp where you yeah. have Jace and Corky both just blowing people up from distance and setting up fights in a really different way. Uh, you know, I think not that, I don't know that the game is better with Jason in it. It may be worse because you have just that super long range, you know, yeah. explosive AOE poke, but 
but it was sort of, I think this was the peak of the, of the particular meta that's evolved in Worlds, was, was that team comp. Yeah. And it forced bans by game three. Forced it, bans. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, like you said, the evolution of the meta. Like Jace, I think, w broke out really huge in the semifinals. There was like a must pick, must ban kind of thing, which wasn't really that, like in group stage, I don't think it was picked, like it was maybe like pick banned five times out of like the 50 games. Right. It was really interesting to see the evolution. Right. In hindsight now, we all say, oh, if only High knew Jace, they would have been perfect or whatever. But if yeah. nobody had Jace on their radar heading in as kind of a mid lane assassin. Uh, Travis, I'm sure there's been a lot of talk amongst players, uh, the ones that are still around, and other things about how different, how much the game has changed over the course of, of Worlds. We're looking ahead a little bit. Uh, we're talking a little about communication, but other things now to this, this final between... Uh, between Samsung White and and Royal Club, what do you, what do you expect to see in this series? It's very funny. I I feel like no one really wants to say like the fear that everyone has that it's just pretty much going to be a repeat of finals last year. Um, you know, like I feel really bad because I have friends and I know people that are flying out to Korea and like this is their big thing, right? And there's a chance that like this huge, you know, what a uh, huge, huge, huge stadium is going to get filled with like 45, 50,000 people, and then we're going to see just a stomp. But I I don't know. It. I think the big thing people are talking about is, you know, like Royal Club is almost just like a sledgehammer that comes in, and no one's been able to like catch it and stop it from like just smashing through them. But White is so like methodical and so smart about the game that it's just very, very likely they're going to be able to do it. Like, uh, one of the guys I was hanging out with today, I don't, I don't like to throw people's opinions out there too much with, unless they've told me, but uh, one of the, the um, pros I was hanging out with today was talking about how uh, like, it's just going to be it's just going to be really, really interesting to see like if what, what happens because Royal Club is just like they're they're all in all the time, and if they if they have to like turn around or back out or like deal with a situation where they're kind of like behind or something, uh, it might just be like way too hard for them because they haven't really faced too many problems like that. So I don't know. Uh, finals finals could be really interesting, but I think there's a very very good chance that we're going to see something similar to last year. I think at this point everybody's just hoping that at least there's four games. <laughs> Any hope? I know we have a piece on Uzi. You did a, a great piece on Uzi that's coming out later today or by the time this aired on uh, Thursday. But any any hope? Any hope? I don't know. I think it'll be tough for Royal to pull out any games. I mean, maybe if White buckles under the pressure or something. But they've looked really, like I think Travis said, like methodical. They've, I think they will like kind of dismantle Royal. Something that... I thought was really interesting about White is how they had such a good early like lane swap strategy and then they transitioned that perfectly into like a perfect mid game strategy. And I think Royal's weakness might be lane swapping and then when they get to mid game they'll still try to fight and they'll be behind and then they'll just get dismantled. I think it's going to be a really entertaining 3-0 stomp because Royal will just fight, 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 fight and the further behind they get the more desperate they'll get and the crazier the fights will get and then the crazier the picks will get going into the next thing. If they get a game, I think it will be a TSM style pity pity win, maybe or whatever, like distraction win. But I I think White learned from that and is and probably won't even they'll just stomp straight through and not not give up. I, I expect 3-0, and I do agree that's anticlimactic and maybe a flaw again of the format where you're not reseeding teams after groups or seeding teams into groups in such a way that blue and white met in the semifinals instead of in the finals. Uh, but that that series was a 3-0 yeah. stomp. So yeah, that would have been just as disappointing. I mean. Maybe more disappointing because you were white waiting is just for it. Too good. Maybe white is too good. What they need to do next year is handicap teams in some. No, I I think. But how do how do you know? Much like last year, you see one team. Last year, you could point and say, okay, Faker is like this superior player, and on the back of a guy who's just way better than everyone else at League of Legends, you can build a team that's just way better than everyone else. This year, White does not doing it. Doesn't seem like it's doing it with overwhelming talent at any one position. Mm -hmm. They just seem well, way Royals, smarter. Right. What? The Royal, definitely. Yeah, yeah um, Royal, definitely. And that's, you know, I think Uzi, Uzi stands out. If, if somehow Royal was to take this, Uzi's the undisputed MVP of this tournament. Yeah. Uh, the other way, I guess you go Dandy would just carrying them. But, yeah, but they don't seem overwhelming, like overwhelming people with talent in one particular area or position. They're just way better at League of Legends than most people are. Yeah, I think you could say that Dandy's the best jungler in the world. I think that's an easy thing to say. Or not an easy thing to say. 
but I think you can maybe make the argument that Pawn showed off as like really, really strong, but I do agree that I think it's more of a team effort. Like they've just been dominating in all five roles all at the same time. When we There's no at, doubt that Mata is like a really, yeah, really yeah. good support as well. Uh, yeah. Like right. time and time again, no people have even... started to see right. just like amazing. If you were designing a strategy and you were like, let's pick on this guy because he sucks. The rest of them are good, but like this guy sucks. There's no, they haven't showed any weaknesses so far that you would say, let's plan around this. Yeah. You just have to, I, don't, I would probably, I mean, if Royal Club maybe is the kind of team that can do this, that can just play very unusually, like balls to the wall yeah. from the beginning, five-man yeah. solo mid push strategy, I don't know, whatever, just sort of like really th mix things up and, and get them off of their game plan. But White just has been dictating all of their games and then gone from there. Yeah, if I were Royal, you'd do a crazy level one every single game just to try to like get some kills early or whatever and then maybe like play the lanes off of that, but... And you have to, you know, you have to go early game champs or like early mid game champs. Blue sort of continued to pick scaling right. champions uh, and then just get blowed out by the time they didn't even get to late game. So you've got to do something different. Uh, so I, I have a 3 0. I mean, I have a 3 0 stomp for white. Is that where you are yeah, on prediction wise? Travis, would you predict a 3 0 stomp for white at this point? I'm going to go 3 1. 3 1. There Just because I'm, I'm optimistic. <laughs> all right, we're all on the record. We'll do we'll do a post mortem next week. We can maybe look back at Uzi's great run and, and Royals' run in this in this world and some other things that stood out as as the tournament overall. But but I think that's it's pretty cut and dry. Maybe not. Hopefully not uh, going into this final match. So closer to home, we've had a, the roster changes start in the off season. Uh, both TSM and CLG have lost their jungler, or their jungler has left. Uh, Amazing and Dexter stepping down, respectively. Um, let's start with Amazing. Travis, I think this caught, we, we talked a little bit about it on the show, but it was 100% speculation. It still caught me a little by surprise to see Amazing uh, step down. And, and where where is TSM now? Clearly, European junglers are just not fit for the NA LCS, I guess, is the, the lesson from this week. Uh, I don't know. I, I think TSM, you know, what's interesting. TSM could, uh, could, okay. So basically for those that don't know, right after worlds, like all these contracts are ending, right? So it's going to be really easy for, I think that's why we're starting to see a lot of these players leave because they're already like beginning to try to find people or they want people to like teams to start thinking of them. So like, for instance, like TSM could pick up Dexter. I don't think that's going to happen, but, um, but like TSM could try to pick up Helios, for instance. They could try to, to poach him from EG. Like, um, and I, I, I know EG has a lot of money, right? But I actually think TSM could probably just grab most people that they want. So I, I'm not. I think TSM will just find somebody really good. Uh, this is the first time we're going to start to see like the effects of of these like inner region rules as well as as TSM is forced to pick up either a non-exempt resident or some, exempt, no, whatever an, it's called. An exempt foreigner, something like that. Yeah, yeah, something like that. It's very confusing, but everyone knows what I mean. Like They can either try to pick up somebody who's already been playing in NA but is an international player, or they could try to find somebody a homegrown. I don't think NA has ever had been known for its like strong pool of jungler talent, so we'll have to see what their options are, but I, I, again, like, like, I think CLG is in the more rough position than TSM, because TSM can just like, oh, we'll take this one, and here's a bag of cash. Right. You I know, mean, I, so. I think it is striking that we went into the summer split with four European junglers in NA, mm -hmm. and all four are gone. At least, as of right now, all four are yeah. not on a team. So what is, what is TSM? Do they go for Dexter, Helios? Uh, what do they need in this position to, to take them from first place out at Worlds, you know, quarterfinals where, where they've kind of been for several years to world contender or the next level or whatever that is? I don't know. They tried to take a playmaking jungle and amazing, and I don't know if it really worked out for them. Maybe it was just like an individual performance thing, but I think the styles, like he mentioned, I think the styles clashed to a little bit compared to the odd one, transitioning from the odd one. So do you think they should go for a more supporty type jungler or...? I mean, if you look at the successful teams at Worlds, they still have playmaking junglers, people who yeah. are playing aggressive champions yeah. and, and really making themselves felt around the map. Uh, so it's hard to say that they should separate that unless the meta changes. One of the things that D-Man tweeted, I think he was the first one to mention this, but more people are talking about it, is that it's very, like, you, you just finished your sentence with it. Uh, it is a very strange time for 
teams to, I mean, you have to right now, right, as contracts end, but it's a very strange situation because you have no idea what the meta is going to look like next uh, next year, next season. And so I think it's a lot better to try to find, like, who's a good teammate and who is going to be, like, a very solid player that we can depend on, like, find something reliable, than try to think about too much, like, oh, right now in the meta, like, it rewards this type of play, so we need to find somebody who's, like, really good at that type of play, like, I think it's really good. It would be a really good idea for people who want to start off the spring split strong to find people, to find players and new new talent uh, to join their team that are going to be able to bring like a great deal of adaptability and also just be like a great teammate. I get that. I, I totally get that. I think I think adaptability is one of those things though that it's really hard to figure out what that looks like on paper. And TSM stuck in a position where if they don't get a playmaker here, you really are just putting everything on Bjergsen. And you're hoping, again, the Dyrus or, or Wild Turtle changes from what they seemed in Season 4 to something different in Season 5, which is unlikely. And, and maybe the meta shifts around to, to such a degree that you only need one playmaker, and that guy's at mid, and then you're fine. But otherwise, it's just the Bjergsen show again and again and again. And as well as Royal Club did with the Uzi show and just supporting that one guy, that's, that's kind of a tough system, I think, to say we're going to explicitly put in place early. And I do think adaptability is good. Yeah. They have Insec a little bit right, setting plays. Even if, like, you look at gold distributions or other mm -hmm. things and Insec isn't carrying the team, he at least is setting the tone for them repeatedly. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I would hope they find a playmaker, but easier said than done, especially with the restrictions on who they can go get, unless they were willing to give up Lust Boy for some other Korean superstar or whatever, you know, like, you're probably getting an NA player, whether that's Odd One coming back or somebody else. Uh, yeah. So I think, I think it's tough. It's hard to see TSM making a big leap with Amazing He's leaving. Yeah, I mean, I think you touched on it with Lust Boy. I mean, it'll be interesting to see for both TSM and COG if this is going to be the, the beginning or the end of roster swaps. Like, should they take out Lust Boy? I mean, I've personally said that I don't think Lust Boy has been that effective, even though he's getting a lot of hype about them turning around the season with Lust Boy. So are they going to keep Lust Boy and try to get a NA jungler? The NA junglers who are really weak, maybe they're trying to poach somebody from another team. But even what what good junglers do the other NA LCS teams have? Like uh, Crumbs. Yeah, like yeah. Crumbs is hyped, but like yeah, not that. Perfect. I think it's tough. Travis, uh, amazing said in his goodbye statement that you know really was the reaction on Summoning Insight and really on Reddit to his play and the negativity and criticism heading his way that forced him out. How much, I mean, this is not the first time we've heard that. This, is, this, is this a trend we're going to be seeing more and more where, you know, young players uh, are just not, not able to take the level of exposure and criticism that you get uh, as a professional player in a professional, you know, high exposure sport? Yeah, I mean, potentially. I. It's very strange, right, because TSM, more than any other team, has discussed the fact that they go on, like, social media hiatuses, and they try to, like, you know, like, I, it's kind of strange to me to hear that because Lokodoko, whenever he came in, and this isn't me calling him out, but Lokodoko, when he came in, said that he was going to prevent people from seeing this, like, Summoning Insight, which TSM had previously called out as being, like, a, you know, very hostile towards them, or at least that's how they felt, uh, is it like, you know, like, I don't understand where he was seeing all this stuff and getting all this stuff if he was blocked off from that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, may maybe that just goes to show you that no matter what you try, steps you try to take, that stuff is still going to leak through and it can still affect you. But I, uh, I don't know. I just, it's just an unfortunate situation. I mean, it obviously recalls, um, it obviously makes me recall Nian, who I still consider a friend, and it was it was rough to see that happen to him. So, uh, we'll just have to see, uh, you know, what, you know, hopefully Riot or teams or whatever can get better at dealing with this kind of thing. Uh, on the other hand, I still don't know what, you know, TSM's plans were for, like, for, uh, for all I know, right, Reggie and Loco were like, oh, Amazing wants to leave? Okay, well, that's kind of convenient because maybe we were thinking about picking somebody else up, you know, totally. so it's hard to say. Totally. All right, so switching to the other team, CLG lost Dexter. Dexter leaving, again, seemingly by choice, uh, according to the statements. No reason necessarily to think otherwise. Uh, they are, they, 
This is this frees up a foreigner spot for them, which gives them more flexibility. And Hotshot implied there was going to be a lot of roster instability, or they knew what changes they were going to make, and they were going to start to make them. So we've seen a change of coach, now a change of jungler. Top lane still kind of a big question mark with Seraph. We don't know exactly what's happening there, given kind of general feelings about him. Where do you see CLG going from here, and what kind of jungler should they be looking for? People will probably take anything I say here as being somewhat informed since people know that I've been hanging out with Double Lift and all that kind of thing. I don't really have that great of insight into the team at the moment. Um, but, I mean, based on his exit, well, I say exit interview, like exit for the season interview that uh, Double Lift did with me at the end of PAX, I kind of consider that like his, okay, I'm done for the year interview. Um, he, he and, and also like other comments he's made since, you know, they, they made it through promotion and that kind of thing. I um, I think it's fair to say that that team is probably considering a reboot. Like, if I'm hotshot, uh, obviously, that's something I'm thinking about. So I would say that almost no one on that team is safe. I mean, Double Lift himself said no one is safe, including himself. So uh, who really knows what's in store? It's it's a lot easier, I think, to talk about Amazing and what like TSM can do there, uh, especially because CLG in the past has not been afraid of, like, hey, like, we've got – I mean, you – uh, Hunter on the show a short time ago mentioned like the idea of maybe Double F should go mid lane, right? So again, just really hard to predict what that team is going to be doing. I think this is only the beginning. Um, uh, we haven't even heard Scar confirmed yet for coach or if that's happening or not. So uh, we'll have to see. But I definitely think uh, I'm I'm not surprised by the change. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Are you optimistic for CLG coming next season? Do you think? Do you think they'll be better than it's, they were this it's season? It's going to be optimistic when you don't have any idea of like <laughs> what they're going to yeah. look like, right? Like, yeah. ask me that question after like the contract, uh, you know, like the window closes on that kind of thing. But I mean, like I, I, one way to think of it is TSM has a lot of money, and because of that, they've been able to do, uh, you know, they've been able to pick up some really good players. I think CLG, if you look at um, the fact that they've brought in like Sandisk and. And, you know, they made the switch over to Twitch and all that kind of thing. I can only assume, again, just by assumptions of, of looking at their popularity and that kind of thing, that uh, CLG also has the money to pick up team players that they want. So we'll have to see. Yeah, I do think uh, having flexibility is nice. CLG has more flexibility than TSM, certainly. And, you know, you it, the meta in Season 4, and it's not radically different than it was in Season 3, is that you want your strongest playmakers at mid and jungle. And they have a jungle spot open, and there was... It seemed to be a lot of dissatisfaction, at least among the fans and sort of armchair analysts out there, keyboard analysts, that, mm -hmm. that they needed to make changes at mid. They have the flexibility to go do that, to kind yeah. of remake their roster from the ground up in whatever direction they want. I would hope if you're going to use two foreigner spots, the places that seem like you would want to do it is mid and jungle yeah, and, and get your best players there, the best players being foreigners. But, yes. uh, that may be unfair, but whatever, put that out there. Yeah. So. Maybe that's maybe that's the CLG plan. You keep your NA rush hour. You flip those two. You get a NA top laner. Done and done. Yeah, I agree. I think mid and jungler are gonna be the important things. I personally, even though there's a lot of Seraph fans out there, I think Seraph's performance has not justified him taking up a foreign spot or whatever. And I think the big big thing that makes me scared of CLG is I don't know. Like, for TSM, you have a kind of kernel to build around. Like, I think Dyrus and Amazing are both great, like, stars and, and Feynman, but also great players. And CLG has shown in this last split that I don't think any of them are, like, that great, except for maybe Aphromoo. Aphromoo is really strong. Yeah. But Doublelift has shown weaknesses. Link has shown weaknesses. Seraph has shown weaknesses. So... I think there will be a reboot, like you guys are saying, but I don't know, what do you reboot around? You just total reboot. But, I, you know, maybe that's the exciting time to be. Although we still don't know, really know who's making decisions over there, roster-wise. Kelby leaving, Hotshot, it's always been kind of unclear what his role is in day-to-day -day decisions. There's no strong coach in place. You don't necessarily have a team leader amongst the players that you can point to and say this this is the guy we're you know mm -hmm. following like until that situation maybe gets clear it's hard to hard to know where they're going to go. The good news for them and, and to speaking to what you asked Travis, they'll almost certainly be better next year because they were sixth this year, which leaves a lot of room for them to go up. I mean I think I think you and you've got two splits to figure it out. So now's the time to take chances. You definitely I mean it was crazy how many changes were being made. 
uh, bef right before summer split, even during summer split, mm -hmm. when you've got spring split to, you know, throw all the stuff at the wall and see what sticks. So if you're yeah. going to do something crazy, now's the time to do it. Two things uh, that I will add. One is, Hunter, you pointed out that, you know, they were six, so there's a lot of space going up. There's also going to be 10 spots, so there's going to be even, the, the ground is going to be even <laughs> lower for them. They can go even further. Yay. There's yeah. more space for them down there. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I was thinking a little bit more about what you asked me, Spelzy, about if I'm optimistic for CLG. Uh, one thing that I think is really interesting is that in the past, the CLG rhetoric around their lo repeated losses, your poor performance has always been like, oh, this is the one thing we need to change, or like we're going to replace this one person, or, or like we just need a coach. I think in this t situation, it's been very promising to me because in interviews and in some uh, occasional personal conversations I've had, it does seem like they have done a lot better. They they seem to be reanalyzing like the core philosophies that have defined CLG for as long as I've known um, them as a team, and I think that that maybe is like they're finally maybe possibly getting to the root of the problem. Though at this point, we've talked so many times over the years of of CLG is going to fix it that I'm. I'm a little jaded on that front. Yeah. Well, given the flexibility, there's definitely the potential to be much better <laughs> next year, assuming they can take advantage oh, okay. of their options. And yeah. done. Okay. Well, yeah. that's, that's it for this week. Uh, Travis, you're there for finals. It should be crazy, right? The, the, this giant stadium full of excited fans cheering on a home favorite that looks like they should do really well. So I expect the scene, at least, in, in the stadium to be pretty, pretty crazy this weekend. Hunter, it is going to be amazing to be in the stadium as all the fans watch this 3-0 game match and everybody leaves going like, wow, that was that was it. No, I've, and it's going to be great. Riot always puts on a great show. Uh, Magic Dragons are playing. <gasps> yeah. I'm enjoying <laughs> Radioactive, which I have only heard about a million times on the radio by this point. And, uh, and I'm sure they're going to do some other really cool things. They've got obviously a really big space and they've only gotten bigger and bigger over the years. So... Looking forward to it. Hopefully, you guys stay up. Are you guys staying up? Yeah, of yeah, course, so. of course. I mean, I'm. I may regret it a little if it's a three-zero stomp, and then I, you know. But of course, I'm staying up. My favorite part of Worlds is always watching people who are too skinny and weak to pick up the giant trophy that Riot is handing them <laughs> somehow collectively get together with yeah. someone from Riot, like Mark Merrill with his <laughs> giant biceps, helping them hold this yeah. thing aloft and then quickly put it back down because they're tired. Yeah, now. did you see like in their Forbes interview or whatever, they talked about that and oh, how really? it was so heavy and it was like, it was like twice as heavy as a Stanley Cup, and then these uh, these <laughs> e athletes are fragile. Or it's something. too crazy. They just cannot lift it. So we'll see who attempts to hoist the Summoners Cup at the end of the weekend. That's it for this week. You can follow all of the content on OnGamers.com on our YouTube channel. Subscribe there. Follow us all on Twitter. Links are everywhere. You'll see everything coming out as it goes. Thanks, and we'll talk to you next week.